Okay, so today we're going to continue learning um, lots of stuff in ARCHICAD. So again, if you um, haven't already, just open up a, a blank document. Um, we're going to be talking about a few different things, including the um, notebook question, which I forgot to talk about last week. Um, a good majority of you have um, done the, the notebook assignment, which is fantastic. And of that, a good majority have done a bloody good job of it too. So that's good to see. So remember with that first notebook assignment, really I just want you to go out there and see how ARCHICAD's being used and what it's capable of, um, just so you can kind of get familiar with where you're heading ultimately. If you haven't done the notebook assignment yet, um, just try and get it done as soon as you can. As soon as you do it, I get an alert and I'll mark it pretty much immediately, depending on where I am at the time, or if I'm awake or asleep or whatever. There is a new notebook assignment as well, which is related to last week's um, lecture. Um, and it should be, if I've programmed it all beautifully, it should already be available on um, Moodle as of this morning. Blah, 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 blah. So if you log into Moodle... Go to the course. You should see notebook assignment two. Oh, available from nine o'clock. Okay, so you won't see it. <laughs> I didn't notice that, but for an hour. <laughs> so I almost got it right. I just didn't notice that it has a time related to it as well. Um, so this time, what you're going to be doing um, is to define some of the common image file formats available. What are the pro cons of each, including the following? JPEG, JP2, GIF, PNG, PDF, TIFF, BMP. Okay, so it's just a Google exercise. Go out there, have a look at the different file formats. If you don't understand what the writing about, don't just copy and paste it and go, whoopee, I've done it. Um, I kinda, I want, it's more important that you understand what these file formats are about, okay? So remember, last week's um, lecture is on... Uh, on MOMIS. Uh, so if you're a bit unsure of what bits per pixel are and that sort of carry on, you can have a, have a look at it again. Oh, you can Google bits per pixel. So, um, yeah. And also I want you to find a couple other, um, like another two image formats um, that you think are kind of related as well. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different ones. All right. Okay, let's leave that for a while. Okay, so, so far we have pretty much gone through how the basics of our objects work, you know, sort of placing them and that sort of carry on. We looked at um, the grids and grid snapping. Um, there's a couple of little things we've, we've, we missed which we're going to cover today. And we looked at um, relative construction methods, which is just a flashy way of saying um, all these menus under here, okay? So remember that was like the you know, drawing normal to something in parallel and um, that sort of thing. All right, today we're going to look at um, grouping, which is actually in here. Um, isn't um, that exciting? However, the groups in ARCHICAD work a little bit different to some other programs in a very, very good way. Normally, and in, in you'll see this in yeah, even Photoshop, you can group layers together. Um, Illustrator, InDesign, you can group things together. Pretty much any program that has lots of objects in it, you can group them together. What that means is that they kind of like act as if they were, were one object. So you could select a whole bunch of stuff, group them together. So if it was a bunch of columns, um, I can select all those guys, and if I go Command G, um, it's grouped. Hang on, sorry, just ignore this for a second. Which means that if I go and move this around, they act as if they are, were a single group. Now, with most programs, if you want to deal with them individually again, you have to ungroup them, delete them, move them, do whatever you have to do, and then you have to regroup them. ARCHICAD's a little bit nicer in that you can suspend the groups, which basically means it kind of turns grouping off, you can do what you like, and then you can turn it back on again. You don't have to go around selecting everything, which could be quite painful if it was like, you know, 
some trees scattered across your entire site, you don't want to have to go through and then regroup them all together. Okay, it's a little bit different to layers, because remember layers, um, like if there's all the tables and this are on the same, same layer, if I move them, I have to move each one individually. Okay, groups are just, they're kind of locked together. So you're going to move them, or select them, or do whatever, they act as if they were one unit. So this guy here is what suspends our groups. So you can go group and suspend groups. It's also up here as well, in one button. Okay, and it's probably somewhere else as well, edit group and group. Ungroup, suspend groups, auto group. Okay, so it, again, lots of ways of doing exactly the same thing. Uh, you'll notice in this menu though, it's got the group and ungroup, okay, which is Command G or Option Command G to ungroup. So remember, that's going to be quite permanent. If you ungroup something, they're all separated. They, you can't regroup them together unless you go through and select them all. Auto group is you'll see this with, um, if I did the wall tool for example, I'm going to make sure I've got nothing selected, wall tool, and I did like one of these poly walls, so that means I can go like this. If I select them, it's automatic, it's actually a whole bunch of little individual walls all grouped together, and you can tell that it's a group because see it's nodes, okay, remember these little points here? These nodes are hollow. So that means it's actually part of a group. So if I suspended my groups, when I select, I just select one part of this. So I can pull that out. See, it's still got the hollows, so that means it's just a visual indicator to me that that wall is actually part of a group. So I go and turn my groups back on again, or turn the suspended groups off. Now it all acts as if it was one unit again. Occasionally you might see this pop up, like for example if you tried to trim something, uh, let's say I had a line running through here, I hold down the command key and try and trim it, it goes <coughs> cannot change the item of a group, use the suspend groups command to enable editing on it. So in all you do is you go, oh, okay, suspend the groups, sweet, and I can trim it. So if you see that little warning come up, it's, that's all it is. You don't have to ungroup it, you just suspend the groups, you can edit these items, and then you can regroup it again. Or like that. make sense? So it's a, it's a nice, nice feature. Can I just ask you to the menus that you got there? Oh, okay, that's um, window, palette. And it's the um, coordinates and the control box. See down the bottom? Oh, yeah. yeah, those two. Yeah, I know I've gone, I have gone through this every week. Those two are, uh, are very, very handy. They should be on by default, in my opinion. We're also going to, we're going to see um, another trick in there um, with the gravity, but we'll have to create a mesh first. All right, so we've pretty much finished that. We've just got this last little thing over here, which is very handy. Let's say I want to put a column halfway across this line. You'll actually notice that a little tick mark at the moment automatically pops up, and that's at the halfway point. So anything I hover over, see that little tick? Where is he? There. Okay, that little tick mark indicates halfway across the line. And that is being controlled next to the OK button there. You can see it says half. Okay, that's why it's, why it's coming up. We can change that though. So let's say, um, oh, that, yeah, there's my, my column on the middle of that line. There you go. Um, we can change that. So we can also say divisions. Let's say I needed to put um, three divisions along here. So it's just dividing that wall up into three pieces. So anything that you hover over, it will divide it into three pieces. Cool? Nice and simple. Again, just very, very handy. You could change this number down here. So let's say it was meant to be seven. 
Cool, and that's dividing that whole wall up into seven pieces. There's also distance, or, oh sorry, there's also percent, so if you need it 20% from one end. There's a little gotcha here, because you've just got to be careful where you enter your mouse, because you'll see it, it's more important with the distance than, than this. But see, if I go from this side, it's measuring 20% from that end. Okay, if I go from the other end, it'll be 20% from the other end. But see this one, this has actually got two different lengths here. This side is longer than this side. So if I go from that side, you can see there's the 20%. If I go to the other side, you can see it's slightly different. So keep that in mind, especially if it's got thickness to it, one side's going to be different to the other. And so you'd want to be consistent. So if it was something like that, it's like, okay, well, it's going to be 20% from the outside every single time. Don't go swapping, because otherwise it's going to shift. And distance, so here's one metre. So that means that we're getting one metre lengths across here. Now, you'll also notice, of course, it's measuring from one end of the, of the wall. So division doesn't make any difference, because it's just dividing it all up. Doesn't matter what side of the wall you started measuring from. With the distance, it does, and sometimes, like with this one, you can see it's not, it's not much different. So again, just make sure, and you can go, okay, well, I want to go from that end, so you just enter it from there, and then you go click, click, okay, which is different from this end. Cool, nice and simple, and you can change again that 1,000, you can change it to whatever you like. So you have to put things at certain distances away from something. You can just type it in and it'll divide it up. All right. This little box next to it, um, this switches it off so it won't do it anymore. So if it's not showing up and you're like, what the hell? How come it's not doing it? It's possible that that's switched off. I'll just click on that again. The next one is the default one. So that's measuring the entire object. So we want halfway across a line. That one there is going to measure it halfway across the entire line. The next one, see this guy? So I'm going to just stick it back to half again. Oops. That's looking at this edge here and the end of the line. And so that's halfway between that point and that point. Okay? Will it do it on this? Maybe not. That's the only one I can really see because it's the only one that's being intersected. Okay, so that's halfway between the end of the line and this wall. Get it? So if you, you can just rule a line through something and it's going to show you halfway between the two intersecting lines. Okay. So by default it's sitting on that with half. All right. Which you could say is the same as dividing it into two pieces. That's why it's got the little two underneath it, which you can't change. All right. I don't think there should be any questions about that, eh? We, we've, I think we've covered everything in here. Um, oh, this is your guidelines. If you switch that off, that's why the, the guidelines disappear. Oops. So you notice that as soon as you go and hover on something now, you can get these guidelines showing up. So if they're not showing up, Chances are that's off. This one here is actually, you can make up your own guidelines. So if you wanted to find out what was halfway possibly, I don't know if you can do the halfway across this, from halfway from here to here. And then I wanted to stick a column. Yeah, there you go. So I know that that there is now halfway between that point and that point. So it's kind of like a, a temporary line, I suppose you could say. It's just a guideline. So you can put it between two points and then you can snap to it. As soon as you've used it, it disappears. So I could have put a line from there to there, hovered my mouse over it, got the halfway point, put the column down and deleted the line. Or I can use that little tool which is nice and quick. Um, the other cool thing with that is you can do it even if you're in the middle of drawing something. So if I was drawing a, you know, whoopsies, a poly wall. And it's like, oh, I need to go halfway. Um, hang on, we'll just pop over here. Why is my mouse skitzing out again? And from there, so halfway between that point and that point. 
Oh, there it is. Yeah, and away I go. Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so again, just a nice handy little tool. Yeah, so that's that one. Oh, that's the magic wand, of course, which is the same as holding down the space bar, which we covered in quite a lot of detail last week. All right. Any questions? No? Awesome. All right. Now, I'll just make sure that I've covered everything I wanted to from that little section. Okay, we've got some pretty cool stuff to do this week. Okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about gravity. One little thing that's kind of annoying. I'm just going to um, select all this and delete it. If you're working with a terrain, every time you put something down, you have to know what its height is. So here's my, my beautiful terrain. I'm just going to lift up one corner. Um, let's say to five meters. All right. So it looks like that. So that means if I want to put um, a column here, I have to know what its height is there. And you know, I could possibly do a cross section through it and calculate it that way, or go, well, if that's five meters and that's zero, then halfway it'll be two and a half meters. You know, that sort of thing. Still kind of involves a lot of thinking, which isn't entirely necessary. So here's our column, right? So at the moment, if I go and drop it, it's going to be the base is going to be at zero and the top will be at two four fifty. Or if you like, it'll be two and a, almost two and a half metres high. This guy here though, if I click on it, it's got a whole bunch of little options under it. So by default it's switched off. This is our gravity. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at an object underneath it and then set the height of whatever it is that you're using, in this case the column, it's going to set the height to what's underneath your mouse at the time. So our options are a slab. So if we had a slab and the top of it was at 5 metres and I click, it's going to set the base of my column at 5 metres automatically. I don't have to think about it. Um, a roof a mesh or um, a new thing which is some sort of shell shape which you can kind of have lots of points that all kind of create a surface. Alright, so let's set it to mesh. Now I actually use this all the time when I'm trying to check out my mesh and see what the heights are. Instead of going around and clicking on the little nodes and going, I oh, have the Z height on that is whatever, you can actually see next to that icon it's got um, delta Z uh, delta is the triangle shape, and it actually has the height. So that means you can just move your cursor around. See, so that's five meters, and I'm dropping. Oh, I'm dropping down over here at zero. So, and I use this all the time just so I can find out the heights. That's very, very handy. Because of course, if you're going through and you're putting all the contours in, you're not entirely sure what's going on. Am I going uphill or am I going downhill? Just grab something like you know, like a column flick the gravity to mesh, and then just move the cursor around and you can see what the heights are. Oh, so grab a column. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so make sure you've got a tool. So, scape, scape, scape. Grab the column tool. See, it's greyed out. Grab the column tool. It's actually automatically going to it now. And set it to mesh. Cool. And if I go and drop a whole bunch of these things down now, F3, you can see they're all placed on the ground. Cool. There is a little bit of a gotcha with this because, of course, if you go and now start moving the terrain around, I'm going to leave those columns floating in the air. So then I have to go through and reset the heights, which is a pain in the bum. Unfortunately, they don't stick to the surface, which would be a nice feature. So if you drop the mesh, it would be nice if they dropped down with it. But then I suppose that could also be terrible, I suppose. All right. Lovely. Okay. 
So, we've got our, um, our gravity. What else can we do with this? I'm going to show you a couple of things in the edit menu now. Um, because one thing is, at the moment, our columns are sitting on the surface, which any of you should know that if you tried to do this, they would probably just fall over. We really need to bury them a little bit. But the problem is, is that what should the height of each column be? And it's like, oh, that would be a nightmare. I don't really feel like going through each of these and adjusting the base from 3987 to 100 less than that and going through and minusing 100 mil and, you know, and dropping it down. Not that that would really be enough, but... Yep, we can group them. That's a very good idea. In this case, grouping is actually quite easy. Actually, I should show you some stuff like that. I will. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. If you go to a tool and you go Command A, it will select all of that object. Remember we did this with the mesh. We went Mesh, Select All, and it will select all of the meshes. So if I go Column, Select All, select all of the columns, and I could go Group, Command G. Okay, so now they're all kind of one unit. So that's, that's good. We've got them all as one unit. Now we just want to drop them down and then go edit, um, move, elevate. Okay, you see that? Command 9. This is a very handy tool as well and use it quite a lot. It's a good one to remember. So you go edit, move, elevate, or Command 9. Oops. Edit, move, elevate. And I can say minus... 200, let's say, so it drops it down 200 mil. Excellent. So they're all actually buried. If I select one of these, you would actually see that the bottom is underneath. Notice, remember it's grouped, so I selected one, I selected them all. If I didn't want that, I just suspend my groups, and I could select just one. Okay, so at the moment, if I click on one and go delete, I'll delete all of them. Alright, it's a little bit hard to see that, but yeah, if you... Notice you can actually see, see it's kind of got wireframe underneath there? Not really on the projector, eh? If you use your imagination, there's little lines going down here. And I can actually see the bottom of that under the ground. That default mesh colour kind of sucks. I'm going to change it just for fun. Alright, can I see it now? Probably not because yellow and green don't really show up much better. Oh, you can kind of see it now. It's quite handy that you can actually see if something's going underground or not. You just select it. You can see the shadow where it stops going into the ground. Alright. However, let's say I wanted the top ones up here to be um, 100 under and the ones at the bottom 200 under. So, okay, it's going to be a little bit of a pain in the bum. I can select them all, of course, because they're all grouped together. I'm just going to ungroup them. So this is permanent because I want to regroup them in two lots. So go grouping, ungroup. All right, so they're not grouped. You can see the nodes change now that it's solid, okay, which means they're not part of a group. If I want just these columns, now I could go through holding down the shift key and select them individually, or I can use a marquee. So this is kind of like, it's, kind, it's not really quite the same as other programs. The marquee in this kind of isolates part of the drawing rather than being a selection. It just isolates. So if I go like this and draw a box, remember single clicks, click, click. I'm kind of isolating what I'm doing. In fact, you'll notice that Edit, Select All, now changes to Select All in Marquee. So if I go Command-A now, or Edit, Select All, it'll select all the objects inside there. But maybe there's other things in there that I didn't want. I could also go, so I've done the Marquee, and I go to the Column, you'll notice that it now changes to Select All Columns in Marquee. Okay? So you can actually draw a shape, in fact it doesn't have to be square either, it could be some crazy shape. If I wanted all of the columns on one side, go to the marquee tool, 
It's got very few options in here. All right, this one here, polyagonal shapes. I can go click, click, all these ones in here. Excellent. Columns, yep. Edit, select all columns and marquee. Cool. So I've isolated that part of the drawing. All right. So I can group those together. Command G. Why isn't that working? Yeah, Command G. Excellent. How do I get the other half? I could draw a box or I could just go columns, select all. Hold down the shift key and that will deselect the other side. You want to practice those different types. Of, there's lots of ways of selecting and finding things and all that sort of carry on. We're going to go through them slowly over the course. So I can group those together. Cool. They're all at the moment minus 200. So if I want to change these, I can go edit elevate or command 9. I want to elevate them by 100. OK. So now these ones are 100 beneath and the other ones are 200 beneath. Cool. All right. So, very handy. So, we now know groups. We know how to drop an object onto top of another object, in this case a mesh, but it could be a slab or whatever. Um, just be a little bit careful. For example, let's say we did this room and I wanted to drop a, a chair in this room and the floor level, let's say, is at 300 mil above our datum. If I went click, chances are I'd probably ended up in the ceiling cavity because that's also a slab. So I'd have a slab up there for my ceiling. So you might have to switch layers off. So if you've got floors on one layer and ceilings on another layer, you could switch the ceilings layer off and ARCHICAD won't see it anymore. So when you go and click, it'll see the floor underneath. So it's whatever's directly underneath your mouse when you go click. Does that make sense? So just keep that in mind. If you've got other slabs, especially if, if it's buildings and things like that or things that are stacked on top of each other, just keep in mind that when you click with the gravity, it's whatever's directly underneath the mouse. So if you've used a slab to create, uh, sorry, a mesh to create some kind of structure, because meshes can be thin structures as well, like a bit of canvas or something, and that's over top of it. If you click on top of it, it's going to land on top of that mesh. It's not going to land on the mesh that you wanted it to. Switch one layer off. ARCHICAD can't see it anymore. You go click, it'll land on the ground underneath. Cool. If you had a buried slab, keep in mind that if you go and click um, and it's set to slab, it's going to go underneath your mesh. So you might need to switch between slabs and meshes depending on what it is that you want it to drop onto. I don't know why you'd, I suppose you yeah, I don't know why you'd have a buried slab anyway, but anyway. Okay. All right. What else do we want to do here? Um, might talk about some more things in this move uh, menu right now, or should I talk about the marquee? Actually, well, I'll talk about the marquee a little bit more. And especially going into the 3D view, and you're going to like this, this is kind of cool. Let's say I wanted to work on just a small portion of my site, just this area down here. If I go F3, I get the entire site, which in this case isn't a big deal because it's so tiny anyway, but if you imagine if it's the size of the site that we're working on, and you're trying to work on the creek, every time you go to the 3D, you see the entire site. And it's like, no, I just want to, and you, know, you have to navigate your way all the way down to the, the little creek and work on it. You might have trees and all sorts of things that it's trying to load. Very simple and handy trick. If you go to the marquee, I'm just going to change it back to a square again, and draw a box around an area. Now here's the trick. If you hit F4, it shows you just what was inside the marquee. Cool? As if it was like a cutaway drawing. It will slice through anything as well. So if you've got a tree half on, the, half on that boundary, you will chop half of the tree off. Okay, or let's say a chair. So if my chair's sitting there, I 
Why aren't I? Why can't I see? Oh, I know. Because my chair is buried under the ground. Delete my chair. Put my gravity on this time. And go blop. Draw a marquee. Hit F4. Yeah, see, I've got half a chair. All right. You might do that a lot in this assignment, is end up burying lots of things. You go through and go, ah, oh, put a tree there and a tree there and a car over there. Looks fantastic in plan. You flick the 3D, you can't see them because they're all buried because you forgot to switch gravity on. Okay. You will find as well that some things are just too tr tricky, like you go and put a car on and it's kind of one wheel's floating and the other wheel isn't. You can sit there and fudge it. There's controls, I know, for the car that you can rotate it a little bit and get it sitting flat on the ground. My advice is if you're just throwing some cars in there, throw it on the flat areas because it's really simple. You put it on the steep leaning areas, you're going to have to fudge it a bit. Later on when you do film CAD, I'll show you and view, we can take your model in and then drop a car and it will drop with all four wheels on the ground, which is lovely and how it should be. All right. Um, now, let's just talk about this a bit more. If I select something and I hit F4, it shows me just the item that I had selected. And here's a little gotcha. If you keep going F2, F3, even if you've got nothing selected, you will only ever see that chair until you reset the 3D view. Um, and it's quite simple. You just have nothing selected, as I do now, and I hit F4 again. It'll reset it. In fact, if you're in the 3D view, so if I go and select something in here and go F4, shows me. If I don't have anything selected, I hit F4, everything comes back again. So really handy if you've drawn something up, you can select it, hit F4. Is it what I expected it to look like? Yep, that's looking pretty cool. How does it look like with everything else in the scene? So you deselect everything, hit F4 again, everything else appears. Also very handy for this assignment because if you've got lots of trees and cars and blah, 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 and you're just trying to work on the terrain, yes, you could switch off lots of layers, or you can just select your terrain, hit F4, and it will just show you just that area. Working on a small area of your site, put a marquee around it, hit F4, bang, you'll see just that area in the 3D. So the F4 thing is very, very handy. There you go, see that? My chair really could do with a slab underneath it. It's half buried and half not buried. Hmm. You can actually move things in here, but we'll... Okay, so we can group things, we can drop things on objects, we can isolate things in the 3D view, which is fantastic. You can save those. I'll, I'll talk about save views in the, um, in the next assignment, but we can actually save those views as well, which is quite handy if you just wanted to do like a little cross-section through something. You know, so you do like a detail, maybe the chair and how it's like suspended with two legs in the air. You could um, you know, do all your little cross-sections and detailed drawings, and you could do that marquee trick, which isolates it, and we can save that view and put that onto a piece of paper, and so, which is really handy. And this is all a very... The, the workflow in here, you'll see later on, is all seamless. So if I change the material on my chair, that little cross-section that I've done, that would update. My sections and elevations will all update without me doing anything whatsoever. All I have to do is change the material, hit print, okay, essentially, or export my PDF, whatever I'm trying to do, and it'll update the whole lot. Sometimes it updates far too much, but better than nothing. All right. So, how are we doing for time? We're doing good. All right, let's just leave that for a little bit. Um, I want to talk about, so with your site, um, just remember you should be um, drawing those contours. You really want to try and get those done this week. Um, 
preferably before the next tutorial session just so you can keep moving on, otherwise you're just working on what we worked on last week, you're not going to learn anything new. So try and make sure you get all those, those contours in there and um, your mesh select uh, created. Uh, if you get stuck, of course, the tutorials and everything are online or you can come and see me. Um, once you've got that though, so hopefully you've got to that stage by Wednesday, um, then we want to start putting structures on there. So already you can see, okay, you could quite easily put a chair onto your terrain now. You've got the skills. You can put trees onto the terrain. One of the things that you have to do though is especially um, a couple of the little buildings, especially that little um, sports one that's on there at the moment, that one's right in the middle of our site. So we do kind of have to model that up because whatever angle we look at, we're going to see that a different side of that building. So we're going to be putting doors and windows and things like that into it. Um, the rest of the buildings, because they're off in the distance, if they're just a big chunky block, as long as they're kind of right sort of proportions and shape, they're going to be recognisable. So like for example the gym. You know, we're going to, we're going to build the gym, we're going to do a curved roof over it and that sort of carry we'll, we'll do that next week. Um, some of the other buildings are just um, like a big blue thing with maybe some big blue triangles on it. That's cool, they're off in the distance, they're just really just so you recognise them. But the sports building, we're going to have to put some doors and windows and a bit more detail into it. So I want to talk about how you place doors and windows um, into a wall. And it's quite simple. Um, there's just a couple of little things you just need to know. The rest of it is like shopping. So I'll show you how it all works. All right. So I'm just going to work off to the side over here for now. Oh, right. That's easy. You just... Did I say that? Just select it, click on the corners... Oh, that's right, I was going to refine the mesh surface, weren't we? Um, tell you what, I'll do that in the tutorial session, just because then everybody should be up to about the same level, and then we can just refine that surface a little bit. Yeah, so I'll do that in the tutorial session, which I think I've actually got written down for the tutorial session. Um, we're going to refine that shape a little bit, because currently, if you go and put all the contours on there, they can be bang on, and you put the mesh in there, it's not really going to tell us the full story, because there's some areas of that model that, um, for example, if I just quickly bring it up, so at this stage, don't panic if you see it. There's moisture inside my monitor. How bizarre. Um, no, it's an old one. All right, so, oops. Okay, so if we look at this area down in here, See this 20 metre contour? 20 metres, 20 metres, 20 metres, 20 metres, 20 metres. It's flat, obviously, isn't it? If all those contours are 20 metres. And that's what the computer will do as well, is go, it's flat. However, there's a, there's a lake there. And so, anybody with half a brain would know, hang on, let's open that, that lakes don't tend to form on completely flat surfaces on the side of a hill. The water will just run down eventually. So what we would have to do is we'd have to put a little bit of a ridge running through here, maybe a little bit of a ridge dropping down through here, and then the bottom of this little lake through here, okay, just to force it around. Remember that most of the contour models won't show you what's underwater. So if there's a lake, like Lake Taupo, um, it's not going to show you the bathymetry of the lake, okay, the bathymetry being the... So sometimes, sometimes you just have to kind of force it in there and just kind of add a few points so that the train drops in. And then we can put a big slab of water in there and you'll see a nice lake that you can kind of see underneath the water even. And we're going to have to do the same thing. So we're going to add a little bit of a ridge line. So if that's 20, I know that this mustn't drop down much more than a metre because if it did, I'd have a contour line. Likewise through here, this ridge running through here shouldn't go over 21 metres because if it did, in theory, there should be a contour line there then. So it might be a case of going, oh, okay, let's just go 20.1, 20.2, 20.3, and then run that up there a little bit and just leave it at that. So that will force the terrain to just have a little bit of a ridge, We're adding a little bit of detail in between the contours, if you like. Likewise, maybe through here, yeah, we're going to go 19.8, 
19.5, 19.2, something like that. So that will force a ridge line. Then the lake itself, maybe we go, that could be, let's say, 18 metres. And just put a whole bunch of 18 metres through here. I usually just do it as a line, because then, remember, all those triangles are all going to come down and form a nice little lake. And then I drop a slab in there, let's say, 19 metres. And if I just drop a big slab, chunk, 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 the top surface at 19 metres, then wherever the terrain drops underneath 19, which is where our lake is, it's going to reveal that slab, and so I'll reveal the water. So I don't have to make a water shape the same shape as my lake. All I have to do is pull the terrain underwater, and I'll reveal the water, which is actually what happens in the real world. In the real world, there will be a water table under our entire site. And if I was amazing, I could create a mesh that represented my water table. So perhaps I got some boring machines and figured out where the water table was through my entire site. Obviously, it's going to change all the time, so it's kind of pointless. Um, I, could create a, I could create a mesh, give it a water texture, and when I go and dig down too far, I reveal the water table, and I know that my hole will fill with water. Okay? So you could do that if you're really pedantic. Um, maybe it, it's necessary. You might even have that sort of information from, from a council or something like that. All right. So we'll do that. We'll, we'll um, concentrate on that in the tutorial session just because you'll all have your models finished by then, eh? Or your terrain models at least. <laughs> okay. So back to walls. So here's my amazing wall. Actually, um, let's just draw a nice big square wall. Here we go. So remember, if I select and go F4, I see just that object. Ching. Lovely. And here's my doors and my windows. Um, there's also skylights. The only thing, skylight's kind of like a door or window, but it fits into roofs. Kind of logical, I suppose, eh? So, doors and windows. Um, I'm just going to drop one in there immediately, just the, just the default one. All you do, click on the wall. Okay, at the moment, I know that the default is centred, so I'll be like clicking on the centre of the door. And I get this little eyeball. And what that is, is the way that the door opens. So if it was the door over there, it's opening in and towards the kitchenette. So if this was our room and I was standing here, I would click over here, and the door is now opening around to where the kitchenette is. It's very, very, very easy to do now. It's a pain in the bum to change. Cool. So, however you want the door to open, boom, boom. Cool. With the windows, oh, I'll leave one in there. You have to indicate so where the window is, obviously. And then what's the outside of the wall? Remember, it has no idea if this is a small building you know, and the outside is outside there, or if it's a big building and that's like the centre but is opened up. So you have to tell Archicad which is the outside of the wall because the window has different features on the outside as it does on the inside. So we just click on the outside. Cool. Okay, I'm going to do one wrong just so you can see. Oh, it's not going to be too dramatic with this type of window. Cool. So you can see that one there is correct. That's the outside. That one there has been put in the wrong way and you can see it looks a bit funny. It's got a bit of an eave. I'll show you something cool. You can actually, if you see this door, if you select the door, so escape, 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 see that little purple dot? Yeah, hang on, it's going to get a better angle. Click on the little purple dot and... No. It helps when you've got a door handle. There you go, now I can see it. Yeah. You can open the door. 
So later on when you do fly throughs, if you go through a door, you can actually have the door open instead of flying through the door. I think you can do it with windows as well, actually. Yeah, there you go. So I can open the window. Now, I don't think I've ever had to teach anybody how to shop for windows and doors, but I'll show you the basics. Um, of course, the like uh, all Archicad objects, and they're very, very, very configurable. Okay, so yes, you can go through and go right. There's that window, that window, that window, that window. However, each one of these windows can be highly modified. So if I select just the one that I've got at the moment, remember this guy up here. So that's what it looks like in plan, elevation, um, wireframe, axonometric. And there it is in 3D. I'm just going to leave it in the 3D. Oh, just remember, this one here is like a pre-rendered version. So if you make any changes, that won't change. It doesn't update. So you'll find that this mode here is the easiest way to work. Cool. Now, we've got lots and lots and lots. All of the settings for any um, Archicad object we'll have this kind of pull down menu with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ridiculous settings. Some of them, especially doors and windows though, have this nice graphical way of changing that exact same information. So sometimes you're looking for something in here and it's a pain in the ass, you can just go to the parameters and go, look, I know it's under doors and windows and sills and what the sill width is. Um, otherwise you've got to go through this way. Same thing. Cool. And you can see we've got Casing yet, yeah, cool. And let's stick a sill on there and casing on both sides and the opening direction. I want them to open outside. Blah, blah, blah. Kind of reveal that we have. And you can just go completely nuts. Blah, blah, blah. Um, notice as well, see it's got two. This is the dimensions. This is all the materials. What the fill will be like. Blah, 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 blah. That's just one of the many settings. We've got the shape of the window. Ah, oh, okay, I need an upper transom and I need this bit to be one metre. Yeah, the window is um, 1500 high, so that means that this section here will be 500. I want a lower transom as well, which is only 100. No, that's, that's just nuts, too small, 250. Cool. So you can just go totally overboard. All the framing and sash, again, dimensions, type of timber that you're going to use, the way that it's put together, blah, 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 blah. The thickness of things. Um, whether or not we've got mullions on our windows, you know, these sort of things. Ooh, that's an editable grid, actually, that one. Custom panel. We can divide it up. Yeah. You can see this window is already completely different to what it looks like over here. You could. You could make up a Photoshop texture and then put that in as the window texture. Yep. We would, um, yeah. In the next one you have to make your own textures and materials in the next assignment. Um, blah, 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 blah. So you can have lots of fun just playing around with all the settings. There's even handles and stuff in there somewhere. Oh, I can put a masonry arch over it. Cool. Yes. You can. Um, two ways of doing it. You could, if I want another window just like that one, right? I could just go option click it and draw another one. Or I can go um, option command and inject those settings into that window. Plus, if I go to the settings in here, 
See up here it's got favourites, and you'll see this on all the objects. Um, are all of the, pretty much all the tools, walls, everything. You can click on favourites and go save current favourite as Zane's demo. Cool. And so now I can go, oh, actually I just need the window NZE, whatever that is, apply. Okay, Zane's demo, excellent, apply. Cool. Empty opening. Awesome. And so, and you can just select the window and do that as well. So I can go to that. No, that's meant to be one of these ones. Oh. Suck the settings out and draw some more. A lot easier doing windows in here. Likey, likey. Yeah, so it's just a case of shopping, really. Um, in this case, you just the windows in that building are pretty simple. So it's just usually a case of getting them about the right size. You'll see that there's sliding windows and doors. Don't get too carried away. I know people, it's very easy to get carried away with it. Um, it just needs to be the right sort of shape and colour and you'll be fine. With the next one, you have, you'll have to make your own custom windows. And we're going to build really customised windows. If you look around this building, for example, you'll see lots of windows in this building that are not in any ARCHICAD library. Okay? And they're kind of configured in funny ways. You know? So they'll have like the louvers at the bottom and then you know, other windows at the top and they've got different shapes and that sort of carry on. And so we're going to um, do that in the next assignment. But in this case, just find window get the basic shape, drop it into the walls. Okay, all the windows, the heights of the windows are always relative to the wall itself. Okay, so you'll notice that when you go and set it, um, you set the height, you're setting the height from the base of the wall. So you're not trying to think of how far it is above sea level. Um, you're just thinking about what the height is relative to the base of the wall. So normally, you would put a slab under your building, you'd put a wall on top of that slab, and you put a window into the wall. Okay? Alright. I'll let you have a play around with that, and I'm going to have a cup of coffee, because my voice is getting a bit sore now. Cool. Is there any questions, sorry, about the doors and the windows? The key trick is, place it, then click. For the windows, the outside of the wall. For the doors, the way that the door opens. Okay? Yeah, there is. It's a little bit of a pain in the bum. The windows, if you select it, there's actually an option up here that says flip somewhere. There. And that will flip it from the inside of the outside. And also, if you go to rotate the window, so if you go, where is the little rotate thing? If you try and rotate it, it flips it. Because obviously... you. The only way you can rotate a window is to flip it 180 degrees. So. Okay, so we've just got a couple more things to go through. I'm going to show you the basics of um, roofs. And we'll also look at um, a couple more things in the edit menu because we can do things like multiply and you know, replicate things and mirror objects and things like that. Um, all right, so let's look at roofs. Roofs are actually now they don't have to be roofs. Okay, these could be wheelchair ramps for you, you know, if you want to. All a roof is is like a slab on an angle. So how do we define that? Is that whenever we go, so for example, a roof or a wheelchair ramp, we always have kind of like a reference line. So you could think of it basically as a contour, although it's a very boring contour because it's dead straight. Okay, but we have to define a known height, and then we're going to define the shape of the object. So if it's a wheelchair ramp, we would say, okay, well, the bottom of the wheelchair ramp is at zero, and it slopes up in that direction, and it's this shape. Okay, we can adjust the angle and all that sort of carry on. So let's have a look at that. So if I go to my roof tool here, 
Um, now you see there's, there's two ways of um, drawing a roof, or major, major techniques at least. This one here is the first one I want to show you, okay? So this is a completely manually derived roof. And what we do is we draw our pivot line, it's actually called. So that's our known height. So at the moment it's set to zero. So if I go and draw a pivot line there, the next question is which side of this line are we sloping up? Okay, again, remember down here it actually says click upward pitch of roof. Nice and easy to understand that one. So it's going up that way. And now I'm ready to draw the shape of my, my roof or my wheelchair ramp. So if it's a wheelchair ramp and that was at zero and it's going up in this direction, I could draw it like that. Okay, so that's zero. It's going up in that direction. Oh, the pitch is actually set to zero, which is a bit boring, isn't it? Let's change that to eight degrees. Okay, so if I select that and go F4, remember I'll see just that in the 3D view, which is a little bit boring because I've got, I might just throw a slab underneath it so you can actually see. I'm going to select both of those objects and hit F4. Cool. So there's the bottom of it. It's sloping up in that direction. That's at zero. And away we go. Let's just, we're just going to have a look at some of the settings in here, right? So, a lot of this is going to look quite familiar to you. We've got um, the elevation of it. So that's that pivot line that we drew. Is at zero. Same thing as what's in that little menu bar. Um, the thickness of it, okay, in this case it's um, 90 uh, mils thick. The angle is 8 degrees. Actually, I'll just show you something. We've actually got two ways of measuring the thickness of this. Because it's on an angle, we could say, well, this is a piece of 25 mil ply. That's the thickness of it from the top surface to the bottom surface. However, if we had like a concrete slab, right, and it's going up to meet another concrete slab, we don't really give a hoot how thick it is that way. We need it to be the same thickness vertically. So if we've got a 100 mil slab and there's a concrete slab coming down and it's joining another one, that distance there is 100 mil. However, when it goes like that, this is going to be different. So we could try and calculate that or we just change that to vertical. See that's changed? So you can see that this would be at 8 degrees. It would actually be 91 mil thick when it got to the top. It's Good idea to keep this in mind because if you go and go, well, this is a 100 mil slab and here's my ramp is 100 mil thick, yeah, and here's another one, 100, you'll see that in section they won't line up, the bottom surfaces won't line up anymore. So you'd actually have to make the ramp slightly thicker. Okay, so I could set this to 100 mil, so that would be 100 mil thick. If we go, we'll go a little bit more drastic in here and you'll see that 45 degrees. And that's 100 mil thick. Whoops. If I change that to perpendicular, it would in fact be 71 mil thick going up. Because as it goes up, then it's going to be cut off at an angle. So it's going to end up thicker. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's just trigonometry. However, all the calculations are taken out of it for you. All right. Um, the home story is relative to which floor it appears on. So you've got to be a little bit careful because Archicad, that's why in your assignment I got you to delete those other stories. Remember I got you to delete the roof story and the sea level and we made the ground floor like about 50 metres high? Because Archicad will quite often, if you go and set the height of this ramp to like, you know, somewhere in the second story, it will automatically change the home story to be up, up there as well. It's assuming that it's a roof and it's going to be on the roof story and it disappears off your drawing, which is very confusing. And you go to the roof store and you'll see all your roofs. It's trying to be intelligent for you, but um, we don't like things to be overly intelligent. But that's how you would change it. You could just come in here and say, no, it's got to be on the, on the ground floor. Um, and again, we've got lots of things. We're not really going to deal with stories at the moment, okay? Don't worry about stories. That's why we got rid of them. Um, we've got things like the cut fill. So when we do a section through it, what is it going to look like? Okay, so if this was made of concrete, we could give it a, you know, a concrete um, type of fill, you know, lightweight concrete. 
You know, it's got all the colours and all sorts of stuff. We'll talk about that one day. Um, cut surface, when we cut through it, what it's going to look like. Outlines, cover fill. So at the moment, it, it has um, a white fill. If we didn't want a cover fill, we could switch it off if we want to give it a different cover fill. Okay, remember the, um, the mesh by default had that grassy cover fill? Blah, 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 blah. Um, here's all the textures. Again, it's very similar to, um, to like the slabs and the walls. So the top surface in this case is metal corrugated. If I want that to be concrete, I can go concrete. And I can lock them so they're all concrete. Um, actually, just while I'm in here, see how this concrete doesn't have any icons next to it? That means it's just a colour. It'll just be like a light grey colour. If it's got... Um, this one here, so it's just got like, it looks like a little picture or something. That means it's got an image attached to that texture, so it'll actually have an image texture. If it's got both, so like the running block, that means that in 3D, um, sometimes you'll actually see it'll have little blocks drawn in there, as if it was like, you know, someone had drawn them directly onto that surface. So that's what those little icons mean. We're going to make our own textures in um, the next assignment. Um, oh, we can also change the edge angles as well. So if we had a block that would cut out, um, we can give it perpendicular sides. So if it was like a sheet of, you know, 25 mil plywood, and you had the edges just cut perpendicular, you can change that. And you can actually adjust the edges. You can actually adjust the edges in here as well. Same thing with slabs. You can adjust the edges each individually. Um, again, in this assignment, it's not a big deal. Okay. So, that's pretty cool. Oh, there's our, our new one because it's at 45 degrees. So, you can change it in those settings again, or you can come into here and change it. 15 degrees. Cool. I'll show you something cool. If we've got like a little wall over here, right? Let's say we've got a um, tiny little wall. Top surface is at 500. And it's going to be running along here, right? Oops, I just want a straight wall. Oh, that's the reason it's not showing up is because I did that F4 thing. All right. If I want this to reach the top of this, I could do some trigonometry. I could do a section through it. We haven't done sections yet, but I could do a section through it and see what the angle was and measure it. Or I can actually just come into here, grab this, see this here? It's got like a little tool, so at the moment it's moving that entire point, but I can actually grab that and snap to the top of the wall. Ching! Okay, in this case as well, remember if my slab here is, actually I'm just going to change this to, um, I have already, so let's make this, we'll make this 50 mil thick, right? Remember, that's 50 mil thick, and this zero here, if I want to drop it down, though, lots of different ways I could do it. I could actually just go um, and set the height to minus 50. I could do that. I could do it in three dimensions. I can actually grab this. That's um, rounding off the edge. That's there. That's there, I think, is moving it up and down, is it? Looks like it. Oh, so I've dropped it down, see, so now it's underground. I could also go edit, move, elevate. Remember this guy? If I went minus 50, <coughs> cool. so now I know. See, I've buried that now, and that's up there. Oh, there's lots of ways of adjusting this. Um, Got to be a little bit careful in 3D doing these things, because sometimes you think you're lifting it up when, in fact, you're pushing it away from you. You know, and then you go and move the view, and it's like, what the hell? My ramp's gone way off into the distance. So you always got to be a little bit careful. And you can actually draw in here as well. Um, again, it's a bit tricky. However, where it comes in handy is... So let's just... I'm going to draw another wall over here. Okay, but this wall here is going to be 1,500 high. Now, I very seldom actually do this. All right. Grab all those and get your four. So let's say I want a roof that goes along this wall and up to the other wall. If you go to the 
roof tool, right? So, in fact, I'm going to do a funny shape roof in this case because they're, they're different lengths. So I can actually clip. See, I'm, I want to make sure I'm snapping to the top of this wall and then up to the corner over here. So what I've done there is I've actually defined my pivot line and my angle in one foul swoop. And now I can draw my roof. And over to here, and back down to here. Cool. So you can actually draw in 3D. Note though, you've got to be a little bit careful. You actually do have to think occasionally. Sorry about that. So in this case, you know, I've done my angle to the inside edge, which means that as it goes over the other edge, it's going to be floating. And that could be cool, because you might have a concrete wall and you're just going to shove a bit of wood underneath there to prop it all up and make it all pretty. Maybe that's a big disaster, you know. Maybe you need to <coughs> shave the top of that off, and so then it would, the roof would actually be at a different angle. So you do have to think about how these um, work. Again, at this level, I don't expect you to. Um, and you could also fudge it later on. So when we do a section through it, we can actually just like, you know, draw in a little bit of timber there, or maybe just like shave off the edge and, and fudge things. Um, Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, we can, we can trim um, the walls to the roof, which we are going to do very, very, very soon. Okay? In fact, we can do that right now. Because let's say we've got a wall. If we need to fill this side in, okay, so I'm going to get a wall. It's going to be the same as this wall over here, so I'm just going to use my eyedrop to pull the settings out. Um, actually, I might go from this side. I'll close this side up. Remember, if my wall's appearing on the wrong side, if it was on that side, okay, it's not underneath my roof anymore, and that's really important at this stage. So I need my wall to be underneath my roof. And I'm going to snap these together. Boom. See how they snap together nicely? That's all nice. It's underneath my roof. However... However, you can see I've got a small problem in that walls have a flat top to them and I need to trim that off. It's actually very, very easy. If I just select this wall, I can go edit, reshape. Oh, hang on. Sorry, design. Sorry, I've forgotten where it is because usually I do it with a keyboard shortcut. Uh, wall extras. Oh, I'll show you in here anyway. Oh, that's right, they've changed it. It's under um, Connect. They changed it a couple of versions ago. So, what we want to do is go trim elements to roof slash shell. Okay, so you go design, connect, trim elements to roof shell. And we click on the roof that we want it to trim to, and the wall, boom. It used to be a lot simpler, actually. It used to go trim to roof. Was it like the, this when you did it? I, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if you have got an older version... You used to always have to switch off all the layers because it would just trim to whatever roof it hit first. And so, yeah, so there's like um, that sports building above the... Uh, what's it? What is that building? I don't even know what that building is. Yeah, above the um, bleachers there's a building. And it's actually got two roofs. It's kind of got like an insert that's stuck up. So people would stick one roof in, put the other little roof on, put some walls underneath it. If you trim to the roof, it would trim to the bottom roof and you'd end up with no walls up the top. So it's a pain in the ass. You used to have to switch all the layers off so you'd only just have the roof that you wanted and blah, blah, blah. Whereas now, you'd actually just click on the roof, click on the wall, boom, done. Um, see, it's got this little icon as well. It was like, ah, oh, oopsies. You can actually click on that. No. You're meant to be able to click on it. Oh, oh I see, sorry. Little X, you go click, and it'll undo it. 
Okay, so I'll do it again. So you go. We're going to go through this um, solid element operations in a lot more detail. Trim elements to roof. Trim. Oops, sorry. Trim, trim the roof, the wall. Cool. See how I clicked the top that time? So I've trimmed the bottom off. So we can trim the bottom off or the top off. This is quite handy if you want to make like a bridge. You know, you could get like roofs to be the bottom of the bridge and then you can have like, you know, roofs going across the top of the bridge. You can trim the bottom off so you'd end up with a nice curved base to it and trim the top of it off so you end up with this wall that kind of fits in between. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of ways of doing it. Undo. So I'll do it again. Design, connect, trim. And that, and see, how you can actually see which side it's going to keep. I want the bottom half. There we go. Beautiful. Anything else you want to see there? All right. So that's nice. And it does a lot of the thinking for us. Um, all right, let's see another type of roof. See this, this little guy over here, right? I'm just going to draw a mark here around him. Oops. So this little guy, uh, if I want to just do a standard kind of roof, I'd have to draw a pivot line, draw the shape of the roof. They'd meet at 50% of the angle, which would be 45 degrees. I'd have to draw a line here and go up like this, and then another roof here and like this, blah, 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 blah. There must be an easier way, Zane, you say. Well, there is. If we go to the roof tool, remember I said there's two ways? So there's this one. So that's where I'd go and find out what the top of my wall is. So the top of the wall's at three metres. Go to my roof tool, draw my reference line. So that's where it touches the wall. It's there. It slopes up in that direction. It looks, I'm not entirely sure what it looks like, but it would probably go something like this. Oh, this is getting tricky. Yeah. And I have to try and trim everything to work. It's going to take me forever. Delete. What we can do is go to the roof tool and use this one, which is an auto magical roof. And I can either draw the shape out. So now I draw all of my pivot lines. Cool. Boom. Just like that. Oops. See, I forgot to set the height. That's all right. Height is three meters. Okay, and it's even given me an overhang. Okay, the overhang is set there, see? If I said zero, no overhang. If I said a hundred, there's a little overhang. Cool, and you can see in here, very similar, the height of it, um, the thickness of it. Actually, that's a good point. Where's the... Oh, here we go, sorry. The pitch. Now, this is actually, you can actually have multiple levels as well. Here's the overhang, 100 mil. But I can actually go, well, actually, let's do um, some kind of strange looking roof. Maybe it goes at 45 degrees for the first 100 mil. I oh, know, let's make that 200 mil, should be fine. I oh, know, let's do that. Add a level. Then it goes 30 degrees for the next 200 mil. And then it goes 15 degrees for the rest of it. Why did that end up there? Can I move that? Hang on. It's got out of order for some reason. Oh, I see, I've done this around the wrong way, haven't I? Sorry, say again? Good question, actually. Yeah, let's just do that for a second. So anyway, so there's my crazy looking roof. Okay, so it's actually doing different heights. 
So, can I offset this edge individually? Yes, I can. Although you can see it's kind of causing a bit of grief. That's alright, I can grab these nodes and reshape it all and make a little patio. Again, all it's done is it's just projected that edge down. Okay, I could also grab the entire thing and stretch it all out. I don't know what happens now to this setting though, because it would... Yeah, see, now it's got manual. It's changed. As soon as I screwed with it, that just got rid of it. Um, but yeah, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, if you click on the edge, so you've got all the same controls you have for slabs and all that sort of carry on. I don't know why it's created so many points along there, but anyway. Oh, that's um, <laughs> the marquee I drew before. It's, it's gone outside of it. Cool. But that auto magical roof is quite convenient. Um, note as well, there should be different ways of drawing that. Down. I'll just delete that. In fact, the way I did it before was a bit long winded because I could have just gone one big square. But you can also do a vaulted roof. Cool. Oh, whoops. Three meters. Well, what's the overhang? You know, 100 mil. Okay, this here. The easiest way to do that trim is just lift up the wall so that they're higher than the roof. So if I just go and set the top of these walls now to, I don't know, 4 metres, let's say. Hopefully that's high enough. No, not quite. 4, 500. Cool. Um... Actually, I don't think I have to actually. Oh, no, I do have that, have that selected. Connect, trim to that, and keep the bottom half. Cool, so now I've done a vaulted roof, and the walls go up to meet it. Okay, in your case, the, um, that little sports building is a single pitch roof. So it'll actually be the same as this one here, basically. Well, obviously look a little bit different proportion wise, but you're just doing one, so you're just doing four walls, one pivot line, the shape of the roof, what angle is it at, and then trim all the walls to fit underneath it. You don't, just take a guess. Yeah. Ultimately you would measure the height of one wall and the height of the other wall and you'd be able to just guess it. Yeah. I'd say that roof is probably at about sort of 10 degrees maybe. 15 degrees, just as a stab. Uh, what, is, what did I set that roof to? Obviously that one's too steep. I think that's at 30 degrees, is it? It was half of that. Notice as well, see I just changed the pitch of the roof and my trim still works. It didn't, like, I should have ended up with the... So it's, that operation's always active. So if I go and move the roof around, it's always doing that retrim. In fact, you'll see that if I go and move this roof off to one side, I'm going to cause chaos. Uh, more ways than I thought. Hang on, F4. Cause a lot of chaos. Where did my other walls go? That's interesting. It's gone and trimmed off. Hmm. Shouldn't have done that. I should have, I should have seen my walls popping up. But yeah, you can actually see these are the original height. What I like to do usually is find out what the height is and set it to it. In fact, you can just grab the height of these. Yeah. Should be able to. Oh, that's right. Good point. It's grouped. Suspend my groups and I can treat them individually. There we go. See, so I can actually bring that roof down. The only reason I do that is so that if I go and select those walls, I can see that it's 3.665 high. If I selected them before, it'd say it was 4.5 metres high. 
but that's not true because it's getting trimmed. So it's, for me, it's just best practice, really. Um, just so I know that if I click that wall, I can see what the, the height is and I don't get confused. Mind you, if I change this back to 30 degrees, Okay, my walls aren't high enough. Not a problem, I can just grab the walls. And if I go here, I can click on this edge again, bring them back up. Okay, the trim's always working. If I don't like the trim, go away trim, that little icon there. In fact, if you go to connect, um, clear all connections, Ching. I get my wall back again. Cool? So have a little bit of a play around with that. I oh, see I only had one of them selected, so it's only undone it for one. But that, that could be true, there might be another building off the side of that. And yeah, yeah, could be something. Well, I've got some funny little thing, and this always happens, this is a pain in the bum. Of course, see that edge there is because this wall's going along, so it's chopped that edge off and then it's projected up through it. Bit of a pain in the ass. There's not much you can do about it, really. Um, I'd have to do a separate wall if I wanted to fix that. All good? But yeah, you guys won. Yeah, so in your case that um, building has overhangs, so it's a single pitch roof, it's got overhangs on, um, on the ends, but the, the parallel walls, it doesn't have any overhang, I believe. Oh no, it has no overhang on the road side, it has a big overhang on the other side because it's got the deck. So you should be able to draw pretty much anything. You're now an architect, by the way. <laughs> you know how to do windows, doors, walls and roofs, bang, you're an architect. Okay. Um, what else can we do here? Do you want me to go over anything? Is there anything that you're not clear with? The the roofs and trimming, you, that just comes with practice. You'll get quite good at it. Okay. But the thing is as well is that this is a very powerful tool because of course you can use this for creating all sorts of things. You can um, have roofs that are doing trim. So if you wanted a, a wall that had like a crazy top to it, you can make the crazy top out of roofs and things, trim to it and then hide that layer. And so that layer is still doing all the trimming and you can still adjust the shape of it but you don't see it. So if that was the case, if this was some sort of weird sculptural thing, if I go to... What's it? Design roofs, des roofs. If I hide that layer, right? See, I've still got the trim. So you can actually use it to trim objects. It's still active. Um, and I can go and turn that layer back on and change it. And it's going to change that trim. So if you had a, a wall that you need going up a, a slope and you want to angle it off, you can stick a roof in there, get the angle just right trim the top of the wall off, hide that layer, you know, put it on its own layer, you know, wall trimming roofs or something, and away you go. So just because it's called a roof doesn't mean it's a roof. It can be wheelchair ramps, trimming bodies, whatever you like. Cool. You can see I've got nice edges to this now as well because the roof trimmed it. I've got a nice beautiful angle on it. All right. Where are my rooms? Okay. There we go. I've got about half an hour left. That's excellent. All right. Let's have a little look in here, right? We've got lots and lots of stuff in here. And you're going to see this in the pet palette as well. When you go and grab things, you'll see these same, same options. I'm going to go through some of these. Some of them are very obvious. And you're like, why would you even have to go to it? We've got um, 
drag. Okay? What drag does is drags an item, which is exactly the same as just grabbing it, moving it, right? You'll see that it automatically goes to drag. So why would you possibly want a menu item? Well, what happens if I wanted to move this object, but I wanted to move it relative to this building? So if I wanted to move this object, but I wanted to move it the same relative to there, I can't do it because if I go and click over here, I select a wall. So I can actually go, right, I need to go edit, move, drag, and go click. Click, see how it's moving relative to that point? Okay. So that's, that's why you can do a drag, which can be very convenient. If you have to move a whole bunch of stuff down, it's all relative to something else. This quite often happens when you've gone and accidentally moved something. Do you want to move everything else in the same fashion? So you can select a whole bunch of stuff and do the same move that you did to something else, and they're all going to move exactly the same way. So yep, Command D. <laughs> yeah, drag though in this case. Whenever you're doing these drags, it's all... So what you're saying is I want you to move from this point to this point. Same thing with the move the screen. If I want this corner to be in the bottom right corner of my screen, I go like that and I'm moving it like that. All right. So that's drag. It's pretty simple. Um, and again, yeah, you can pull it up. See, if I go and click on here, I can say drag and I'm doing the same thing. Right. Oh, sorry, we'll select something again. Right, let's select something a little bit more interesting. Let's say this thing here, right? Edit. Move. Rotate. The rotate tool... Um, oh, we kind of did this with... Um, remember, ages ago, we rotated the grid. Same sort of thing. So we're going to rotate. If we want to rotate this, what I have to do is I have to say, okay, where's my central point? Where am I rotating around? So if I wanted to rotate this so that let's say this edge here was going to be horizontal. I'd click on that point because that's my center of rotation. And then what I'm doing is I'm kind of like, kind of like a, a pivot handle, if you like. So what I'm saying is I want this edge here to be horizontal. <coughs> cool? And that's what Command-D, I think it is. I go undo, Command-D, from there to there, rotate around. Cool? So what are you doing? Saying here, here and then moving it around. Okay, if I want to drag it so that this corner here was touching this corner here, I can go Command D, that point to that point. Okay, I want to rotate it so that this edge here was flush with that, Command E, that's my center of rotation, this point here. Notice as well, see I can actually bring this right up. Cool. If I want to grab all of these things okay, and rotate them around this point, Command D, okay, let's say I want to do it 90 degrees, click, click. Okay, undo. If I want to, if I want to get this guy so that it was like sort of halfway around the center, that's a little bit more of a trick zone. How are you going to do that? I'd have to actually kind of construct, I need, if I wanted to rotate this building so it was around the opposite way, hmm, I kind of need to, yeah, I could mirror it. Um, however, if I mirror it, then these windows would stay where they are, didn't they? It isn't quite what I want. So all I would do actually is just get a line, remember, set to half, Here's the halfway point, go from that wall to that wall. There's my pivot point. So now I can go and select this building. I'd actually, warning, I've got a roof as well. So I should really switch the roof back on, because otherwise I'll leave the roof where it was. Which actually in this case would make no difference, because it would rotate underneath the roof. But Cool. Oh, didn't want that. Hold down the shift key, deselect that. Okay, that's what I want. So, Command E, rotate around this point, and it doesn't really matter how I do this as long as it's 180 degrees. Ching! Oh, it's ro rotated the whole thing. Yes, I could flip it as well. These lines here, I would normally create myself a nice little layer called construction lines. 
Cool. And again, yeah, little cunning trick. You put a space in front of it, all your layers all end up at the top of the list. The reason I do that is that those lines can be very handy, but you don't want to print them out. You might have lines all over your screen. Um, especially with the next assignment, you're going to end up with a lot of lines to, you know, drawn out to so like locate objects and things like that in, in the real world. We don't want to delete those lines because if we ever have to figure out what we measured wrong or adjust anything, we want to be able to see all our construction lines. We can switch them back on again. So in this case, um, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to select the whole lot again. Oops, didn't want that. Shift, select it. This time I'm going to go edit, move, mirror. Okay, I'm going to mirror through this line. So I just have to click on this line. Oh, this is like that. For some reason it didn't. Okay, so I've mirrored the thing. So, which isn't very obvious in this case, but let's say if, if we do it. Yeah, exactly. And these windows will be mirrored. Let's do something a little bit more obvious though. Let's say, um, I don't know, oh, actually, this guy here. So I can go, in fact, you'll notice as well, if I go and click on it, there's actually the option right there. There's mirror, there's rotate, and there's drag. Cool. So I can say mirror. Um, now I can define my own line as well. So if I go, I want you to mirror through here. See how it's... Um, now, here's a cool thing. Let's say, okay, I want you to mirror, but I don't want you to get rid of the original. I want two of these. Click on it, mirror. Here's my axis. If you touch the option key, see how you get a little plus next to the icon? See like my, my cursor's getting a little plus? If I do that, it mirrors a copy. Cool, so I could then go, hey, that's cool, yeah, that's what I want, and I select all that. Click on the edge, mirror. I want another copy through here. Cool. Okay, so you can mirror a copy. You can do that with everything. If I want to rotate a copy, and go Command D, rotate around this axis, just touch the option key, and I've got a copy of it. If I want to drag these guys, so Command D, drag, touch the option key, see it, boom. Pretty funky. All right, that's all good. Sorry. Ah, good question. Actually, I'm not sure if you can do it with the option key. Hang on, let's go drag. So it usually ends up with. Ah, oh yeah. If you go command option, uh, you go option command, so you get two pluses, and you can just keep going until eventually you hit a return or double click. Yes, and that segues beautifully into the next bit. <laughs> so what I'm going to do this time, I'm going to grab a column, okay, just a single column, and we're going to go edit, move, so we've done all these ones, we've done drag a copy, rotate a copy, and mirror a copy, that's what happens when you go and hold the option key down. Drag multiple, so that's what happens, you go option and command together, It'll add, you get two little pluses next to it. Rotate multiple copies, which we just did. And now there's this multiply tool, Command U. And this little menu pops up. So we've got lots of different options here. So we can drag a copy, rotate copies, elevate. So if we're making like a, a ladder or something, you wanted lots of copies all on top of each other. And a matrix. So let's just start off with the, def the default one, drag. How many copies do we want? I want six copies. What's the vertical displacement? We'll come back to that. Um, we've got a few different little options down here. So this is an increment. So what I'm going to do graphically is define the distance between two of these. So if I just go OK, um, I'm going to do it from the centre of this column to the centre of the next column. Okay, I could go D. Oh, OK. Notice something's missing. And I know I've helped lots of you out individually with this. And there must be some keyboard shortcut that switches it on and off. And if you discover what it is, please tell me. 
because people turn it off and on all the time. Remember, normally there's a little, a little box next to it that says the distance. Okay? At the moment, it's actually highlighting up here, which is exactly the same thing. But see this guy up here? It's got like a little arrow, a little cursor with a yellow box. And so now that distance thing pops up again. So there's some way of switching this on and off. I don't know what it is. It's obviously very easy to do, but that's how you get it back. Okay? So if it's disappeared, it's not the end of the world because, yeah, that's also the distance there. Okay, so okay, distance, it's a uh, 200 mil. Hit return. Cool. So there's six copies. So I've got seven in total. Six copies all 200 mil apart from the centres. All good? We'll do it again. I'm going to grab all of these guys now. Actually, no, I'm going to grab these central ones and go edit. Well, it's command U, but anyway, edit, move, multiply, or command U. This time, I'm going to do distribute, right? What distribute does is I'm going to say the total distance I want. So I can say, okay, well, I want six copies of these three distributed over, um, say, a metre. So I go D1000. Cool. So I've got six copies, and they're distributed over a metre. Did I put it on oh no, For a second, it was on a funny angle, but I don't think it is. Sometimes, I'll just check that, just to make sure I haven't gone off on a funny angle. Ah, I have. Whoops. <laughs> Undo. Command U. Yeah, six copies. So I make sure I snap. There we go. D1000. Excellent. They're all vertical now. That's a, that's a metre, distributed over a metre from that point to that point. I don't know, actually. It look, no, it looks a bit smaller than that. 77 millimetres apart. See, oh, from centre to centre, sorry, 167. Yeah, whereas these ones, because these ones I said I want them 200 apart. The other one I said I just want six copies over a metre. No, but that's a good, that's a good one as well, because, okay, let's do that. Let's go, command U. I want to spread, and I want them 200 apart, and I don't care how many copies I get. So now I just go from there. Cool. So I can actually just go... So they've got 200 mil centres. Oh, sorry, not... Yeah, 200 mil centres, yeah, because I'd set it to, to 200. I don't think you can. No. But you could calculate it, because it's whatever the... That's going to be the centres minus the... the so what is, what is one of these? 90, which is an annoying number. Let's make that 100. <laughs> by 100, Oops, so it's already square anyway. So that means that if they're 200 centres, that should be 100 mil apart, eh? Are we right? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, I'm just going to get rid of all of these. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to get rid of all of these ones. So, what else can we do? I'm going to make these um, 100 mil high, so they're basically square blocks, right? Uh, 100 by 100 by 100. Okay, so they look like that. Exciting? All right, this time I'm going to go Command U. I'm going to do exactly the same thing, so I'm going to do 200 mil spacings, but I'm going to give it a vertical displacement of 100. And I'm just going to drop a big slab underneath it so I can actually see it on the flat, basically. Select all these and go F4. 
So now I've actually got um, a vertical displacement of, what did I say, 100, didn't I? So the, that every time it increments, it, it raises it 100 mil. Pretty cool. All right. So that's pretty cool. That's neat. Want to see something? Want to see a cunning trick? Let's say that these were going to be some kind of weird stairs, right? But obviously I can't have these things floating. Um, I'm just going to column select all. All I'm going to do is set their base height of all of them to zero. Ching! So now I've got a whole bunch of columns. So simple little trick. So I just selected them all and set all of their bases to the same. So the tops are still 100 mil higher than each one, but the bottoms are all set to zero. I could have done it the other way around as well. I could have set the tops all to one value and the bottoms would have stayed. That's pretty cool. What else can we do? Just go undo, undo, undo. Actually, I'm going to get go all the way back to one of them. All right. Um, I'll just drop my big slab down as well again, actually. Otherwise, they're just floating in space and it's really hard to understand what's going on. Okay, command U. Oh, actually, sorry, I haven't shown you this one. Distribute minus 1 is very handy for if you're doing like a whole line of trees, for example. So I want a whole line of trees. I want six copies of them distributed between here and the fence line. Right? So I go all the way to the fence line. However, I don't want one on the fence line. Okay, so it's going to put six copies between that point and that point. So, yeah, very handy for trees because that's exactly what I want. Alright, I'm just going to skip past these ones. I'll come back to them in a second. Matrix is basically the same thing, but we define two vectors. So we're saying copy out in this direction and then in another direction. So let's do, um, we'll do the spread again, right? So I want spacing of 200 in one direction and along the other one, I'm going to say 100, so they'll actually be touching. And the vertical displacement of each one is going to be 50 mil higher and 100 mil higher. Excellent, check this out. So now I'm going to go in this direction, ding, 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 and then in this direction. Add this to the mix. Check that out. Okay, so they're going up 50 mil increments higher in that direction and 100 mil increments in this direction. And if you were alive in the 80s, you know that this is a, looks like a game called Qubit. Set the base heights all to zero. Oops. Cool. Now I've got a very complicated looking structure and it wasn't very difficult to make at all. Pretty neat, eh? And then I'd have to do sections for each single one and then like lay out a dozen different drawings and some poor bugger's going to have to chop all these to exactly the right heights and it took me, what, ten seconds to draw. Uh -huh. Okay, so we can, and you can multiply and repeat all sorts of things. So once we do um, cross sections, you can do those. You can put a section down and then like repeat it every five metres and have multiple cross sections through your entire site. Well, it does actually because it's just the way that the math works. Because if I'm going up in this direction, when I go in this direction, they're going to automatically meet. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I don't think so. I don't think you can do this graphically. No, there's no, yeah, it's, it's all numerical. But, yeah, if I said um, distribute, that's going to be quite different. 
because, well, is that going to do it? Yeah, so that's doing it graphically. Yeah, although I didn't have any, um, yeah, that's kind of, let's see, I didn't have any on that direction. Six by six. Yeah, so then because it's in the graphical one, it's actually going to. And then I'm setting the elevation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always a bit weird when you do things in the 3D view. Because you're dealing with a 3D space, but you're interacting with it through a two dimensional space. So it's always a little bit kind of fluffy. <laughs> but yeah, you can see you can make some really cool stuff. Yeah, pretty funky, eh? Um, so yeah, then we've also got like the rotator copy. If I just um, let's get rid of all that. So if I go Command U, um, rotate six copies, vertical displacement. I'm just going to set that to zero because otherwise it's going to look a bit confusing. So we, again, we've got increment, distribute, or a spread. So we can say like every how many degrees. So let's say we said okay, I want them every 15 degrees, and I want you to rotate around this little corner here. And maybe yeah, like that. Awesome. Oh, hang on. Cause I, that marquee trick is the best option in this. So if I go and do a big marquee and go F4, I'll always see what's inside the marquee. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I could, I, yeah, I could make a really interesting amphitheater. If I'd used slabs like a, rather than a column, then I could adjust the edges so that they all meet nicely and things like that. Or I could do it with chairs. Although I'd have to do um, a little bit more of a gap between them. If I've got one chair, I'm going to have to zoom out a little bit. Make my slab a bit bigger. Grab that chair. So if we rotated, uh, the only thing is I'm going to have to kind of give myself a little bit of room here, aren't I, really? So I'm just going to draw a nice little construction line that goes from the centre of this chair down to about here, right? So I'm going to rotate around that. Command U, rotate, yeah, every 15 degrees, that would be kind of cool. Around this point here. No, didn't give it enough space. <laughs> Command U. Um, I have to give it more. 45 degrees, although that's going to be a bit boring, isn't it? Maybe hey, we'll do it from down here somewhere. See the little orange dot? If you click on that, see it kind of... No, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Eventually you'll get it right. Actually, I could go... Oh no, I can't. Could distribute six copies if I wanted six <laughs> chairs around here, then I'd be able to see. No. It's gone outside my marquee. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> well, you can see there's lots of different ways of doing all this. So if I went and took, really what I should do, if I want to do that, yeah, if I go Command-U, I want to drag 
say six copies, yeah, I'll distribute them with a vertical displacement of 500 mil back going in this direction. Oh, like that one, command U, rotate. I don't, I want that to be zero now though. We'll do another distribute, let's say around that point. You could do that I suppose and then just like chop out a few chairs. If I remove that one, and that one, and that one. That kind of works. Blah, blah, blah. And if we have a look at that. So it's really up to your imagination. Okay, I think that's everything I need to cover. Um, I note as well, it's in that that's that guy there is the same thing, the multiply. Command U or edit, move, multiply. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why. Usually I find, yeah. You see, it just doesn't want to do it. Oh, there it goes. And then all of a sudden it does. Go fish. Okay, have I covered everything in my list of things? Oh no, I haven't. How much time have I got? Ten minutes. Um, last thing I'm going to show you is, is it, it is quite easy and you can have a lot of fun. It's um, doing 3D renders. Okay, we will go over this in a lot more detail, um, especially when you get to it um, in the tutorial sessions. But if you are in the 3D view, right? Um, let's see, where are we? Just reset my 3D view. There we go. Cool. I'm just going to make this slab a whole lot bigger. So I've got something for the shadows to fall onto. So this is a 3D view. Now this is what's called OpenGL. Okay? It's hardware driven. It means that I can rotate the view and see things. It all happens in real time. Which is nice. But the image quality is pretty crappy really. Okay, especially if you like compare it to like Avatar or something. So, under Document Creative Imaging, I'm just going to go straight to Photo Render Projection. What that does, we'll see all the settings, is it's actually firing rays of light into my scene until it hits an object and then it traces that back to a light source. Okay, and it can figure out where all the shadows and highlights and all that sort of carry on are. It's a little bit boring. Let's, we'll chuck a tree in there, eh? Um, objects, visualization, site improvements, garden, tree deciduous, it's nice. Cool. Okay, if I want to put it on my hillside, remember I've got to turn the gravity on, I'll pop it up there. Alright. Oh, actually, there's a little gotcha, actually. You'll notice that by default, for some stupid reason, trees have no shadows. If you select the tree and go into its settings, you'll actually see it's got an option there, shadow, off. No, we want it on. I suppose architects aren't interested in tree shadows. I don't know. Creative imaging, photo render projection. Cool. So you can see we've got this lovely shadows and ref there's a little bit of a reflection in this floor for some reason, a shiny floor. So this is what we're going to be doing for our final one. When I said that we're going to do some renderings, so that's basically what you're doing. Let's just have a quick look in the photo rendering settings. And you see we've got lots and lots and lots and lots of settings. The main ones that we're interested in, it says, it says their engine, it says Lightworks rendering engine. We're going to come back to that, but that sets basically the math behind it. Um, actually, I will show you now. If you click on that, you can see it's got internal engine, which is actually what you're looking at pretty much. It's very boring. It doesn't do very good reflections and things like that, but it's fast. 
That's about the only thing it's good for, really. Lightworks is awesome. And then there's a sketch renderer as well. I'm just going to go for the default settings. Zoom in here a little bit more. And then go document, creative imaging, photo render projection. It'll take a little bit longer. Turn, turn, turn. So it's using a different algorithm to make our image. And look at that. It's a sketch of our site. So this is what you show the client as your preliminary idea for the site. <laughs> and it's actually just a sketch render. And they charge lots of money for it. If you ever play around in those settings, um, and I'll let you do that, because it is just a bit of fun. This here is like a whole bunch of presets. You can see like Technicolor. See, it's just changing all of the settings in here. And you can see what these do, these shadow lines and hatch lines and sketch lines and how thick the lines are and overstretch and blah, 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 blah. This Technicolor one, though, is just a whole bunch of presets. So if I go Document, Creative Imaging, Photo Rendering, and now it's doing it with the Technicolor sketch option. You can make your own up. You can make all the lines all really rough and looks like a really, really rough setting. Yeah, it's like, looks like it's been done with crayons. You can turn shadows on and off or make them different colours, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pretty cool, eh? It's a lot better, of course, of what a Photoshop sketch render is just... It, just a Photoshop sketch render has no idea what lines are and edges are and fills are. So it usually just does one big thing over it. There's no way that it can go, oh, well, the edge of this roof is going to overshoot a bit, you know? Whereas this one can. It knows what things are. That <laughs> looks awesome, eh? I love all these, these poles. It just looks like, you know, something I'd draw. <laughs> yeah, it's just an image. So you can just save it as a JPEG. So, light works or anything. Um, and, and going back to this, you can see there is a couple of little things. So you can switch things on and off. So if we wanted to switch the, um, the sun off, we can. The camera actually has a light on it as well, which is a little bit weird. So I'm just going to cancel this for a second. Because if you go into here, somewhere, I think it's under more, it's got lamps, right? If you go and click on here, you can find all sorts of lamps, including street lamps. Somewhere, there we go, street lamps. That's rather huge, isn't it? I don't like that one. Lamps. I could change the dimensions, of course. So, so this one is four metres high. Oh, this little guy, he's only three metres high. That looks quite nice. Oh, isn't that nice? I'll put a couple of these in. In fact, I'm even going to put one inside the building. In fact, I'm going to just put four, no, too big. Let's have a look. Lamp. This is just a general light source. It doesn't actually look like anything. It's just a light. Um, and I'm going to put it about um, two metres high and pop it right inside my building. Okay. Now, if I rendered it as is, well, for one, it's set to sketch render, I think, isn't it? Which is a bit weird. And I change it back to Lightworks. If I render it now, I'd still have the sun on. However, I don't want the sun, so I'm just going to switch the sun off. And go, OK. Document, creative imaging, photo render. So now there's no sunlight. I should really change my background to black, because it looks a bit weird otherwise. And now it's all being illuminated by the lights in my scene. Pretty neat, eh? You see, I've got a little bit too much ambient light. So ambient, ambient light is a made-up light. It doesn't exist. If you look under your desk, you can see objects, even though there's no light directly shining on it. Even if we switched all the lights off in here, and even tried to close as much of the curtains as we could, there'd still be this ambient light. Okay, and the ambient light is going through the, you know, it's through the louvers and hitting the wall and illuminating that a little bit, which bounces off the you and everything else in the room and eventually makes it under the table. 
that calculation is so ridiculously complicated um, that we just kind of fake it. And so that means that the ambient light is just this, like everything's just illuminated a little bit. So if we switched off ambient light, let's close it again. That would mean there's absolutely no ambient light, which is going to look a little bit weird. Um, also, see under here it's got background. I'm going to set the sky colour to black. Or maybe like a really dark, bluey colour. Not that I can actually see the horizon anyway. And the ground colour to black. Document creative imaging, photo render projection. That looks a bit more like it's at night. Okay, so you can see like some things almost completely un invisible. Okay, it looks a lot more like a night scene now though. Cool. And you can do that with your model as well because there are lights in this around the sports field, so you can pop some some in there and switch the sun off and and do a night rendering. And they look they look pretty cool because you get lots of different light sources. It actually shows off the form of the land a lot more. You get some really neat looking night scenes. Okay, we'll wind it up there. But yeah, have a play around it. Have a, have a, by all means, just play, have a play around with the sketch renderer. Have a play with sticking lights in there. Um, the lights and all that all work in the same way as all the objects. Okay, they've all, they've all got their own unique settings. Some have got lots of settings, some have none whatsoever. Um, yeah. Um, it does if I want it to. But yeah, so I'd have to go file save as, and I can save that as an image. However, and that's how you're going to do it this time, we'll just save that to your, your hard drive. But um, later on I'm going to show you how we can save these views, and we can lay these out, and that means that if I go and move the lamps, um, I can go and produce a new PDF and it will go through and re-render everything for me. But yeah, we will get there. But at this stage, just go file, save, and save off the images. Cool. Excellent.